parents want to form children into their image, not into the image of God. And so that's sometimes the big twist. I think that parents have to just reckon with their own hearts first of what do we want from our kids versus who is the Lord and what does he want for our kids? Hi, welcome to the Family Teams podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Family Teams podcast. I'm excited today to be joined by Jonathan Holmes. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for jumping on here today. Well, thanks for having me, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Yeah. So Jonathan is the founder and executive director of the Fieldstone uh, Fieldstone Counseling, and he's been on uh, pastoral staff on some churches as well as written a number of great books. Um, he really helps uh, churches in particular kind of navigate some of the especially most challenging kind of areas of of identity um, and and a lot of things that are happening. I think in the in the whole counseling world, and so I, I'm really excited to dive into some of those topics. Jonathan just uh, wrote a book, a fantastic book called Grounded in Grace, Helping Kids Build Their Identity in Christ. And I'm I'm very, very interested in this topic of identity. Um, yeah. And man, this is such a hot topic that we need to understand at a much deeper level. So I, I just wanted to jump right in, Jonathan, to that conversation. Um, wh why do you think identity is, like, how do you define it? And then why do you think it's becoming such an important topic today? Yeah, it's a great question. I agree with you. I think it is one of the hottest topics today, but maybe not in the reason why a lot of parents and uh, Christians might think of it. And here's here's how I'll come at it. You know, you hear a lot today about mental health in children and teens, how depression, suicide, anxiety rates are higher than ever. And I know in the counseling room, that is one of the foremost things that we see and I think a lot of parents uh, are kind of treating the, the tip of the iceberg, but underneath, I think those struggles with anxiety, depression, um, social media technology, I think are really questions of identity. Uh, who am I? Uh, why am I here? And what am I supposed to do with my life? And I think that a lot of our kids and teens today have looked to their friends, to culture, to media, to find a sense of identity. Uh, our culture has said, hey, dig deep into your feelings and find it on your own. Yeah. And it hasn't worked. And I think that a lot of kids and teens have tried that, are coming up short, and are really anxious, really depressed about their future, which is why I advocate in the book really coming back to Scripture to find out uh, who God is in what He says about us and what He designed us for. Yes. So who who am I? Why am I here? These questions are becoming extremely confusing to people yeah. in a way that it has not been historically the case. So. What, what do you think has, what, what, what is happening culturally to make this such a difficult, uh, difficult thing to ground our identity in, in something? Right. I, I think in our postmodern, post Christian environment, uh, we have definitely moved the authority of identity to the individual. We've said, hey, the individual gets to decide who they are, what gender they are, uh, what they want to identify as. And the way that you find that out is you dig deep into your feelings, you figure out what it is that you feel you are, and then you go out into the world and you demand acceptance for that. And that's been a, that's a significant shift for how identity was formed for the greater part of human history, which was more of a traditional uh, identity formation process, which was your identity was already preset based off of where you were born, what family you were born into, what gendered body you were born into. A lot of those identity making characteristics were already preset. And I think in our post Christian culture, we've kind of thrown all that out the window and said, hey, it's totally up to you under the guise of freedom. But it's actually really not freedom. It actually, I think, becomes quite enslaving because your feelings constantly change and you end up becoming enslaved to whatever it is that you feel. Some days that's good, but a lot of days that's not so good. And I think that that's caused a lot of inner turmoil and a lot of external things for kids and teens today. Yeah. So help me understand how the gospel, the scriptures, ground our identity differently. So one of the, one of the, one of the elements that I, I'm really trying to understand about this is, like you said, traditional cultures, um, they, they were more collectivist. So yeah. you were told who you were, you know, what you felt, you know, at this some, some given day or as an individual um, was not necessarily 
a place from which you would ground your identity. Um, right. But there is something about the gospel itself that does cause us to be a little bit more individualistically referenced than I think a lot of traditional cultures. And so, and so th there's sort of like a spectrum here, or I don't, I don't know how you would describe it, but you have the traditional culture. Like, does the gospel suggest a more collectivist, traditionalist way of, of viewing this? Or is there, does it actually <clears throat> push us into a more individualistic frame and then give us a different way of, of grounding our identity um, that, than the culture does? Like, how, how do we, uh, there's sort of like, like three yeah. things going on there, right? There's a traditional culture, there's individualism, and there's the gospel. And I'm trying to understand, yeah, right. how, how do you see right. that interacting? No, it's, a, it's a great question, Jeremy. I think the gospel actually blends the best of both of, uh, I would say, a traditional and a modern identity formation process in the sense of it begins and ends with God. So God is the one who says, listen, this is who you are. This is why I've made you. And now there's a great freedom within that framework, I think, for human beings to live and to flourish and to fulfill that purpose. So the constraints of traditional identity, which was Hey, based off of where you were born, what socioeconomic demographic you were born into, the parents that you were given, it was much more rigid, a lot less freedom of expression. On the other side of that, though, modern identity promises everything is about your feelings and self-expression, but there's no point of stability. There's no external voice of authority that says, no, this is who you are on good days, bad days, and hard days. And a gospel identity, which is what I advocate for in the book, is an identity that is received and not achieved. It's an identity that we receive from God revealed in scripture that's true on your best days and it's true on your worst days. And I think that for me, at least as I'm talking to parents in the counseling rooms, uh, that really is the benefit of grounding our identity in Christ and in scripture. Okay. So walk me through the, how that actually works in the context of childhood. So I, I'm imagining somebody's growing up and they are wrestling like everyone does with, okay, like, why am I here? Who am I? They may go to a, they may spend a lot of time in sort of peer oriented school settings. Um, and yeah. they're trying, we're trying to help them as parents ground their identity in the gospel. Are there some things that you would say, look, um, there are sort of transmission tools that are dangerous or like, like, um, there's, there's a lot of debate obviously now around, uh, peer oriented, um, sort of childhood versus a more family oriented uh, at certain ages. And so, so yeah, walk me through how this identity is formed. And then it does seem like family, peers, media, all are playing a role as well in the midst of all of this. So yeah, like, and this is getting complex. So I just want to understand like, how, yeah, how do we pull this apart? I'm trying to, how do you see this? Yeah. Is it and it's a question that I think a lot of parents are asking. I would say, put simply, in the ideal scenario, families are going to be, I think, the best vehicles in context for godly identity formation, mainly because nobody's going to be around your kid more so than the parent, hopefully, in an ideal yeah. setting. I know a lot of times that's not always the case, but in an ideal setting, it's going to be parents who step up to the plate, who are teaching and talking to their kids about who the Lord is and what he has called them to, you really are the most influential person in your child's life, really at those youngest ages and hopefully moving on forward. Maybe that influence gets wielded in different ways, but hopefully that influence remains as they get prepared to leave the home and go out uh, onto their own. Now, the downside of that, Jeremy, as I'm sure you know, and as your listeners know, is that a lot of parents have stepped back. They've abdicated that. They've yeah. kind of stepped back from that parental role and I tell people this all the time. If you don't want to disciple and train up your kids, somebody will be more than happy to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And culture has, I would say, in so many ways, filled that gap, whether it's YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, teachers, education, et cetera. Again, not all bad, but everybody would love to disciple your child. And they're not going to be discipling your child, I think, in the way that scripture calls us to. And so parents, I would say, I just plead with them, you do play such an important role. And I would say one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest downsides, though, of where parents can go off is that I oftentimes find that parents want to form children into their image, not into the image of God. And so that's sometimes the big twist. I think that parents have to just reckon with their own hearts first of what do we want from our kids versus who is the Lord and what does he want for our kids uh, maybe you want your kid to go to an Ivy League college. Maybe you want your kid to be the starting five on uh, their high school basketball team. And maybe you want your kid to be the most popular, whatever it might be. Sometimes we struggle with putting 
our own agenda for our children ahead of what God has called us to uh, in their lives. Yeah, man, that, that is a collision. So talk to me a little bit about what, what's a realistic understanding of how much peers versus family play in the identity formation process. So I know that w- one of the things that like th- there's a book, I don't know if you've read it called Hold On to Your Kids. Um, there's two secular psychologists who were making the case that mm-hmm. we have made the decision to hand over our children um, into a peer-oriented environment in which just for the sake of survival, because of just the sheer number of hours they're spending, um, in, in picturing like a middle school girl, for example, in order for her to realistically fit in um, with seven, eight hours a day, immersed in a peer-oriented environment, she's going to be need, she's going to need to react to the way that her identity is being formed by those peers or what they're saying about her, what kind of subgroupings they're placing her in. And that when that identity collides with the family identity that's giving to her at church or through her family in the faith, Basically, their case is the peers are going to win because of the survival instinct of the child. Basically, they're they're saying um, because they're forced into this environment, this peer oriented environment, you, you're not. They, they have to make um, some calculations, and all of a sudden, when when these two identities collide, they're going to. And this is kind of their thesis for how adolescence has become so reactionary against parents. Why there's such a rift between parents mm-hmm. and children because. Because when a child realizes that their parents are trying to put on them an identity that's different than the one that actually is going to cause them to succeed at school or in a peer-oriented f- fashion, they they push hard against that and they they reject it. So yeah, what 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 do you see, especially in the middle school years? I'm thinking, like I said, that middle school girl. Like, do we have to be more realistic about uh, the impact that peer orientation or social media or some of these other things are having on our kids? Yeah, I. I mean, I'm not super familiar with that study, but everything that you're saying completely tracks. I I know that from an early childhood development stage of life, uh, kids that have siblings, uh, we know that siblings tend to be the earliest socializers of of, uh, the sibling. Uh, Meaning if you grew up in a family and you have siblings, those are some of your earliest social connections and memories and influences. And so we realize even at an early age, uh, the people around us heavily influence us. So yeah, you're moving through elementary, you're getting to middle school. I would not want to be a middle school boy right now. Uh, I have four daughters, two of whom are in middle school. It is rough out there. You're right. right. It is. It's a difficult um, season, and it reminds me of what Paul says in First Corinthians 15, where bad company corrupts good morals. So yes. we know the influence of friends is key. I think one of the things I would encourage parents then with to counterbalance that, if you can't completely eliminate it is how do you positively early on set in the groundwork for gospel identity? How do you teach, talk, train, and disciple your kids into an identity that is rooted and based in scripture and that points to Christ? Namely, your friends are ultimately going to say fundamentally two different things. You are what you do and you are what you feel. Uh, You are your report card. You are your performance on the athletic field. Uh, You are whatever you want to be sexually or gender-wise or romantically. And pushing back against that as early as possible and as often as possible to help kids say, you are not primarily what you do and you are not primarily what you feel. You are who the Lord says you are. And scripture says you were made in the image of God. uh, You're fearfully and wonderfully made and you belong to him. And because you belong to him, here's how you should live. And I think a lot of times parents get a late start in that game, honestly, uh, they do cede a lot of that territory to peer-oriented influences, to teachers, to yeah. EV, um, to other influencers. And I think parents have to reclaim that in many ways. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's a tough job. <laughs> it is. It's it like really, it's getting harder. <laughs> it is. It really is. Yeah. And, 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 and any, I, well, uh, John, any tools for grounding? And I'd, I'd love to hear any, like, what, are there practical things that you've seen parents do that have really made a big difference in that area? Uh, uh, You know, one of the things I would say is I think a lot of parents need to really get to know their children. One of the things we advocate for in the book is becoming an expert on your child. Um, I think a lot of parents uh, don't practice curiosity. They don't really seek understanding of their child. Uh, Sometimes they can just deal with the 10% of the iceberg and the other 90% that's below the water. We we can kind of just leave that underwater. We don't really pursue it. So 
encouraging parents to ask really good questions, to know their child's temperament, their strengths, their weaknesses, their temptations, their distractions, uh, their desires, their dreams, to find out, uh, listen, where is my child most prone to put his identity in or to place her identity in? Is it in their actions? Is it in how other people think about them? Is it in their popularity? Is it even in how maybe I view them or see them? So I think a lot of times parents don't really operate on a deep knowledge of their children. So then what happens then is their interventions or their discipline or their discipleship is not in keeping with who their child is. And so that's really the whole movement of Proverbs 22, where the author says, train up a child in the way that he should go. It's this, it's the sense of train up a child in the sense of knowing who they are, knowing their character, their, their personality and their disposition. And I think uh, that's an area where I think a lot of parents can grow in their understanding and in their practice. Yeah. One of the things you said in that was sometimes there's also a danger in them thinking they are who I, as a parent, am trying to make them into, or yeah. that's a very yeah. difficult line, uh, to figure out. So how much, where is that line? Like, how would you describe, because I mean, part, part of the the reality of, I think, ancient cultures is that they had these rites of passage where they would confer identity from the community or from the family very directly onto the sons or daughters. Um, and we we don't really do that culturally anymore. I think um, I remember the first time I went to a bar mitzvah, I went to like a, a worship service, like it was, a, I was at a synagogue mm-hmm. and it was like three hours long. I'm just focused on this one boy. It's like 200 people in the congregation. Um, all of the male relatives had flown in for this. And I went Ooh. from that that experience, like seeing, and, and it was amazing. They, they had done, I mean, he had spent a whole year with the rabbi, you know. I mean, it was like the amount of identity that 13-year-old boy, and I know this was just one event of many that were going on um, around his bar mitzvah, but it was it was, it was just so intense. And then yeah. I, I went uh, uh, not too long after that to a worship service where they were baptizing like 50 people and they, they, because it was a mega church, it was just like, psh, it was yeah. like, <laughs> it was like factory style. And I was just like, so struck by the, uh, the difference. So yeah, I'm curious where, where that, where that line is, how much can we impart identity to our children? Is, is there going too far? Yeah. No, I think that's such a salient observation. One of the things I talk about in the book is, um, well, I reference Paul Tripp. He talks about ambassador parenting versus ownership parenting and ownership parenting is where hey we think we own our kid we're supposed to make them into our image our identity our agenda and trip i think rightly counters and says uh, no we really are ambassadors for christ we're about his agenda and his priorities you're the mouthpiece for that you're the physical embodiment of god's agenda for your child uh but but you're not trying to make them into your image. And I think that as parents, we do have to keep that in mind. Are we acting like an owner or are we acting like an ambassador? And so when we're talking about identity, are we making sure to nuance, caveat, add disclaimers into our conversation that make clear, hey, here's an expectation or a desire that we have for you, but the foundation out of which that activity comes from or that desired behavior comes from is your identity of who you are in Christ. So yeah, we don't want you to hit your brother. We don't want you to steal, et cetera, et cetera. But that's coming out of an identity that is at the foundation. And I think a lot of times we can focus on the activity and the behavior. We can ignore the heart, the identity of the child. And that's a conversational piece, I think, that can get added in, again, early and often as possible. And you know, we don't always, I know I for sure don't do it perfectly the majority of the time. So we need God's help in so many of those conversations. Yeah. Are you following us on Facebook and Instagram yet? Look up at Family Teams to get even more free content and never miss out on event announcements. What's interesting too is, you know, in that framework between being an ambassador parent and a owner parent, Yeah, seems like part of what that, sort of assumes, and I think this is the common reality, is that you have the the individual identity of the child and then the individual identity of the adult. And so um, what I hear, especially the examples you're giving for an ownership parent, is somebody who 
is, uh, you know, maybe a little bit on the narcissistic side as a parent. They, they want to, they want to like live vicariously through their child. Right. And so there's a, there's a desire to imprint them not out of real knowledge of the individual child, but really out of selfishness, um, yes. the yeah. that the parent has. There's a third category, and this is what we talk about a lot of family teams that is almost entirely missing culturally today. Um, but I see it so strong biblically, which was that there used to be a family identity, right? There was a, a sense of who we are as a family. And so as a yeah. parent, I'm not, I don't own you, but right. I, it's not my individual identity versus your individual identity. It's the fact yeah. that you come from somewhere. Our family didn't just e e erupt, you know, out of nothing. Like um, we, uh, there's been a lot that has been, that it will be poured into you and a lot that that, you know, uh, through God's grace, we would love to see you, you continue to carry on. Now that yeah. most people don't have that at all. Like they, they don't hand they, that to their children. They've yeah. lost any contact with their root structure. And I can't yeah. help but wonder if the identity crisis that we are experiencing across the entire culture, not just in the Christian world is maybe mostly rooted in a lack of family identity. I'm curious what your yeah. thoughts are about oh, that. Jeremy, I think you, I think that you really are onto something there. One of the things we talk about with the problems of modern identity is just, it's like American individualism on steroids, because what yes. we do is we tell every kid, you are unique, you are special, dig deep into your feelings, go out into the world and demand acceptance and affirmation. Every single person is individually on this voyage of self-discovery and self-realization. And what it ends up creating is... Uh, I think a lot of self-involved, self-focused, self-referential individuals, because we're all on this quest towards, you know, being the best we that we can be to the detriment of, like you said, any sense of collective family identity or a collective family structure that we belong to, that my actions impact somebody else. Uh, I don't really care if my actions impact somebody else in today's culture. And I do think that ironically, that is not unifying us it's actually dividing us more than ever we've told everybody go be whatever you can be and we have thought that the product would be everybody would be happy in living their authentic selves but we've actually seen the exact opposite and so i think you're absolutely right if we can emphasize that collective family identity a couple of degrees more i think that would have a significant impact and again that's where i think the local church in the the metaphor of a family of God becomes such a rich metaphor for us to utilize in our own parenting and in the identity formation process for children. Yeah. And this is part of what I'm trying to understand. And one of the things I really appreciate, um, I was listening to some videos, Jonathan, of you walking churches through so much of the issues regarding gender confusion um, yeah. that are erupting. And, and I know you I've thought deeply about this um, and have counseled, you know, personally, lots of yeah. um, uh, people who are struggling with gender dysphoria, families that are walking through that challenge. And so I, I think I'm trying to, there's, a, there's sort of two layers to the conversation I really want to have with you about this. One is, um, I, I, uh, I think there's our kind of collective Christian approach to the problem of identity and then how it's now become this open door for the enemy to um, really cause so many people to think the gospel is bad news. Um, you know, the idea that the gospel is saying overt things about things like gender, um, saying yeah. that men are men or women are women. Um, yeah. You know, I was I was watching a street preacher not too long ago, you know, trying to witness to and and the guy just kind of walked by him, just started screaming at him like, your God hate, hates gays, you know, whatever. So. Um, this is the defeater. I, I think this is the the core obstacle that this generation is going to have with receiving the gospel. And right. and I and I think that there's been like multiple ways that I think I've seen different um, different thought leaders try to approach this challenge. So there's the there's the um, I would say the more evangelistic way of approaching it. Obviously, there's sort of like the a, a liberal way of approaching where we start affirming and agreeing with mm -hmm. the culture. I know neither of us think that's the right move, but in terms of those of those of us who really want to stay grounded in scripture, um, mm -hmm. there is a desire to be um, to be careful to, okay, we need to be more thoughtful about our language. One of the things you said in a video that I, that I was listening to is when you're in a, um, a church setting, um, the emphasis um, on like family 
and constantly lifting that up as the norm. This is not a direct quote, but I'm, I wanted to interact with you about this. Um, this could potentially be outputting to the large number of single people that are that are in the church, um, and obviously people that are on on whatever spectrum they're struggling with. So, so there is yeah. there is a desire to be like more winsome, and then there's I think this counter move. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, I, I think it's theologically grounded. And this is what I'm really wrestling with. And I know it got, you know, a lot of airtime with uh, Rod Dreher's Benedict, Benedict option, which is guys, yeah. um, mm -hmm. we need, we need to retreat more from this and we need to be, we need to kind of create more of an insular culture. Um, Peter Thiel, he's a famous investor. He's not an evangelical Christian, but he's a believer. He was making the case on a podcast I listened to recently that, you know, you have, Ultra Orthodox Jews with about a ninety percent rate, and, and Orthodox Jews um, mm -hmm. of retention of their children. Um, mm -hmm. Amish communities we were talking about when we got on here. You look close to Amish country; they're they're about a ninety percent rate of retention. Evangelicals are um, I, I've heard statistics as low as twenty percent. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's we the crisis is so immense. And and somebody was asking Peter Till this question, and he he said, "Well, the reason why evangelicals lose their kids is because of evangelism." And I was like, "Whoa." Like, and he said, yeah, the, because the way that you think about your faith and you, you train your children to be empathetic to these um, different ideas. And it's not surprising that in those very vulnerable seasons of their life, that kids that are, you know, more open, they're going to begin to doubt their faith when they meet a friend who's transgender or who is struggling with same sex attraction. Um, anyway, yeah. so th there's these two spectrums and I, I want you to help me think through, like, yeah. why shouldn't we go towards something that's a little bit more, um, like we're going to create a little bit more of a closed culture, um, because we live in this negative world where, um, we've already essentially lost the cultural battle. And right. if we continue to send our kids, um, it, at the same rate into the culture at vulnerable ages, the inevitable result is going to be, we're going to have this horrendous a fall off rate that we we are experiencing as evangelicals. Right. right. Well, I mean, again, not not super familiar with some of those statistics, but I think they're obviously alarming, but they track and they make sense with, uh, you know, I think what you were sharing, you know, I think one of the appeals of, you know, something like Rod's book, you know, the Benedict option of, you know, let's, you know, I'll move on to the same cul-de-sac and, you know, kind of yes. form up what we huddle here is that it is responding to, I think, this cultural problem that we're having in our current culture where um, the way that children and teens come into an understanding of what is right and wrong looks completely different than it did for our generation and generations before us. And I try to help parents understand that of the way that you train and teach your children looks very different, right? You're going to be going to scripture, trying to help them understand their faith, but they're going to schools and talking to friends who think that the Bible is, you know, false, that it's not really an accurate recounting of reality. So the battle that you're up against, I think in my mind really is, is God true? And is he revealing himself in scripture uh, as he said he is? And if, if that's not the fundamental starting point, for you and for your kids. And if that's not portrayed in a positive way, then I do think that you're up against a little bit of a losing battle because Satan and culture are going to be more than happy to step in and say, did God really say, did God really mean that when he said this than this? So uh, let's take gender, right? The way that we talk about gender historically, culture would say it's restrictive, it's repressive, it's oppressive. These, these two binaries, you've got to release yourself from that uh, old antiquated way and get on the right side of history. And I think I think the church has to own some of that because I don't think the church has done a good enough job of positively portraying gender as a gift yes. of God's grace. And so that's where, you know, in talking about the role of parents, the family, and the church in the official formation of children and identity, I feel like we have a long ways to go, Jeremy, yeah. in, in terms of helping children see gender is not random. It's not a social construct. It's not whatever you want it to be. It is God's good gift to you to live out your image bearing capacity as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I just, I know for me, I never heard that growing up in church yeah. and I didn't hear about it a lot. It was, if anything, it was more of an incidental footnote as we're talking about Adam and Eve. But the goodness being made male and female biologically 
wasn't really talked about. And I think we have a generation now who, because we haven't talked about, somebody else is willing to talk about and say, yeah, it's all up for grabs and it can be whatever you want it to be. Yeah. But that type of authority, no child uh, really has the capacity and really shouldn't have the capacity uh, to wield on their own. Yeah. Yeah. So if I, I think it's really important to try to understand what, yeah, what, what, where does gender come from? And yeah. um, so the, there's, there's like two battles. There's two, two hypotheses that seem to be playing out in the secular world. There's a, it's a social construct, uh, which has really been um, the academy, especially the humanities, the, you know, psychology, sociology, they've really um, lifted this up. Then there's, it's a biological concept, you know, um, construct. It's, it's in, it's innate, you know, you can look at people's DNA, their gonads, you know, there's, it's mm -hmm. clear that there's, there's, there's a binary gender within biology. And so these two are, are fighting. And I, and I, you know, those of us who believe in scripture, one of the things I guess I, I keep wondering, and the implications of this are what I really want to help you, like help you help me understand, like, so if, if, if the scriptures are saying that, uh, God himself creates gender in Genesis one, um, it's a biblical God designed, uh, concept. It seems to me like it really exists, uh, for the sake of the family, right? Like, um, that's the reason. So it's really a family construct that's designed by God. Um, that means, and this is what I want to get your feedback on. It seems to me that the way then you would define masculinity and femininity is that you would think about masculinity primarily from the perspective of a man is, is really, and this, this is all the way down to like, you're, you're trying to teach a five-year-old about what it means to be a man, you know, someday, or what it means for him to be male. It, it means, yep. it means preparing to be a future father or, uh, like a female it, it's the, what you need to be aiming yourself at from a gender perspective is, yeah. is motherhood. Now that, yeah. that, that is so radioactive to suggest, uh, to individual children who, um, have their entire lives ahead of them and who knows what career path they're going to pick, or if maybe they're called a singleness, there's such huge pushback for actually framing gender in a family way. And I've, I've heard almost no one, even in the Christian world, be willing to do this. And it right. seems like, like if we don't do this and, and, and then part of it is, well, what are you saying to women who are infertile? What are you saying to, again, it's just like all the exceptions come to the surface and the exceptions cause people out of empathy for those who might choose different paths or out of a desire to respect, um, people's individual individuality, we right. enter in the same level of confusion as the culture about what gender is. Like, how, how do we, how do we, yeah, how do you think through this? No, I think, I think you're, I think you're onto something there with the exceptions. Sometimes we load up the exceptions at the front end and we leave the general teaching and principle way, way, way in the background. And so all we hear are all the exceptions. Uh, but yeah, the, the capacity to be a father and the capacity to be a mother, to have children and to father children, uh, that doesn't get talked about a lot. I think you're right. I think that that's probably seen as quite uh, reductive and old fashioned and wrong side of history and yes. um, bigoted, et cetera. Uh, another way that I try to approach it with the goodness of male and femaleness is that it follows the creational order in Genesis 1 of God is creating everything in a binary. He's creating light and dark, day and night, land and sea, land animals and sea animals. So if you're a first century reader and you're listening to the creation account, the rhythm of creation is, is all building up to God creating male and female. So that rhythm of God creating two binary genders would not have been a surprise. It would have been expected that that's the pinnacle of creation. There's something about two binaries, two opposites, when they come together, are able to fully reflect the image of God. That's the whole point of Adam. Adam cannot be an image bearer of God on his own. Mm. God says, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And again, we I don't think that we accurately communicate that to our children, that the goodness of the male-female binary is the ability to fully image a God who exists and has lived in a triune community for all of eternity. And I think when you put it in that frame of reference, I think it adds a whole layer of transcendence in beauty to gender that we just oftentimes don't get in today's culture. So you're saying it's beautiful because it creates community? It creates community. I think it gives us a holistic picture of okay. who the Lord is. 
Okay. It gives us a holistic picture of this is who the Lord is, and this is how he operates in this world. He has designed and created us in his image, and as you were saying, that image-bearing capacity for Adam and Eve, the very first words that they have from the Lord is, be fruitful and multiply. Hmm. Uh, it's a, it's an inv- I tell people this all the time, it's an invitation, not a prohibition. Yeah. Right? The very first words of God to human beings are not, hey, don't do all of these things. It's, no, go do these things. Be fruitful and fill the earth. Multiply and fill the earth. And when you're talking about that capacity then for fatherhood and motherhood, I think in so many ways, that's what's being, that's what's being directly referenced there. Okay. The Family Plan Calendar is the new way to keep your family team organized. Plan your rhythms, menu, household chores, and notes for the family all in one place. Visit familyteams.com to purchase. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think that's the, that, that's a very tricky place for, like you said, our culture to, to think about, because I, you know, in a, in a clinic, clinical sense, when you're talking to, let's say an eighth grade girl who's really struggling with gender identity, and she's yep. in the midst of this social contagion where she sees people identify as queer and identify, you know, uh, females who are identifying as, as male. It seems like if, if in the light of that, and even in the conversations around transition, one of the very odd things that seems to just not be talked about hardly at all is, um, is when when you go on these uh, uh, sex change hormones, or you're you're even you're even um, really working through this ideology. The primary thing that's being under assault, and we, we think about that we think about that girl as an individual and what she's struggling with as an individual. But but what's about to happen? if she makes a decision or if we hand minors the decision to transition is that her ability to become a mother, um, will oftentimes be over. Right. Um, yes. and, and so th- if you, it, it does make sense in some, at some level that if you basically put, uh, boys and girls into essentially a, um, an environment in which gender is is really neutralized, and this is what we've been desperately trying to do this in in our schools and our entertainment. Like we we're trying to like just level every distinction, and then of course, if the girl and most like eighth grade girls aren't necessarily thinking about motherhood, like that's that's way down the road. Um, and you know they've they're now experiencing you know their period. They're like, why would I want to be a female? What are the advantages if there's not a culture that's constantly lifting up the beauty of motherhood? And that you're, you're going to someday really want this, like over 90% of women, you know, by the time they're in their thirties want to be mothers, but not Mm -hmm. necessarily 90% of eighth graders, but this is when they're making that decision. And we're, we're also not, we're not freeing that decision with, with, with family. There's not, there's not an understanding or an appreciation for the family implications. Um, and, and I, it's, it's like, I just don't see the church bringing that topic into this conversation, like we're, we're still, it seems, and this is what I'm curious, like, it seems like we're still framing this as an individual problem. And, and then we'll talk about it in very high theological uh, language, but it, it yeah. seems like it's rooted in our, our, in our theology of family that seems to be either missing or very weak. Um, but yeah. yeah how, how do you, how do you see this in a clinical context when, when boys and girls are at that stage struggling is this family theology is it central to the discussion or is it is does it always seem to devolve into a, a, like an individual discussion yeah well I'll, I'll come at it from this way and, and i think hopefully answer answer your your question i do think that there is a significant struggle with family authority and authority in general in terms of how families live it out and here's what i mean is in placing all of the authority with the individual which is what modern culture wants to do uh, whenever parents then try to exert their authority, that's seen as a negative because your authority parentally is impinging on my personal freedom and authority. And I've been told and been led to believe that I'm in charge of my life. I am sovereign. I can do whatever it is that I want to with my body and my life, my body, my choice. That gets trumpeted pretty much all across. And I think what has happened is, is that parents have not accurately talked about authority and they have let culture shape the entire conversation around authority. So authority is almost always seen as a negative. It's seen as keeping you from what you want. 
rather than saying, no, God's design is actually that we all are people under authority. We live in his world under his rule. And he has delegated that authority and that power to parents to exercise within the context of the home. So the goodness of authority is that when you live under your parents' authority and live under uh, your parents' guidance, that's not a negative, that's a positive. So the goodness of me submitting to that is a positive, not a negative. And I think that that's something that we have that we have lost and that we have not been able to reclaim probably as a church. If for whatever reason, we're not talking about it in a positive way, there's definitely abuses of it as well. And we've seen that. And so culturally, we kind of want to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater too. But I think if parents were to reclaim a godly and beautiful and holistic picture of authority, I also think that could positively influence the conversation. Because to that eighth grade girl that you were referencing earlier, uh, yeah, is that eighth grade girl, you know, concerned about being a mother? Maybe not then, but like you said, when she's 30, she might be. And it's that type of parental insight that can be offered from a mother to a daughter that says, right. hey, I know that this might be what you feel right now, but trust me, honey, I don't think that this is the wisest, most godly, best decision for you. And I'm not going to allow you to do this. I'm not going to allow you to take that hormone or that puberty blocker. And if she has grown up in a place where godly authority is exerted and lived out, the chances for her to submit to that are going to be far greater if she sees it as a good thing. If she doesn't see it as a good thing, she's going to want to rebel against it and claim her own authority. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, that does. I, I, I do think it's important. Like, we do need to know. We're talking about minors. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and there's a great confusion about, and our culture does say, like, yeah, you should be able to define who you are when you're 12 and make permanent decisions for your life. And that authority has been delegated to those parents. And there's a jurisdiction there that needs to be respected. Um, and obviously they have the wisdom and the, and the perspective to be able to do this as opposed to, and, but I think, um, part of what I also want to like really understand is, is there something beautiful or good about the way that God designed this? And, and the, the kind of last topic I wanted to kind of explore with you with regards to this, um, is trying to understand. So the Bible has, has an incredibly narrow sexual ethic. I mean, it's like, it's like, one man, one woman, after you make the covenant of marriage, you know, for yeah. life. Um, yes. And so we're defending this, this, this exceptionally narrow sexual ethic. And I think that there is a, um, the culture itself is super confused. And I think that the church, we've had a really hard time articulating why is the, why is the sexual ethic so narrow? And I, I've struggled with this a lot, trying to even figure out how would I, how would I articulate this to somebody who doesn't necessarily have faith in scripture? why this, why this is a good thing, right? Because it, it, part of what, obviously, um, it's, it, you can see it in scripture and, um, but it's <clears throat> part, part of the thing, our job is to give an answer for the reason why we believe these things. And, right. <clears throat> um, and so as I've thought about like, what, what was God, um, attempting to do by creating and insisting on such an incredibly specific narrow sexual ethic where you have one man, one woman, you, you read through like Leviticus 18, you're, you see all the, 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 uh, the, the prohibitions. And when you look at that, to me, it does seem like the purpose of this narrow sexual ethic was to create a culture of thriving multi-generational families. So many of the, um, of the specific, e even the specific prohibitions about certain family members. I mean, it gets really crazy if people haven't read Leviticus. <laughs> um, it, you can see what it's trying to do. It's assuming you've got a village, right? And you've got a multi-generational family in that village that's raising children. Um, and incredibly close proximity with 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 a large extended family member and and uh, members and all their their community, and they're in the the Bible's insisting on this very specific, very narrow sexual ethic in order to I think preserve and and cause that to flourish. So in the same way that and this is an argument I, I hear rarely made. One of the one of the real tragedies in a in a culture like that of same sex attraction is that it potentially ends the family line. Like they're they're. The, the the ability for that, if you create a culture that celebrates um, uh, basically alternative lifestyles of any kind, um, and I, I would say that, you know, that then you, you have this, and we have, of course, now famously this plummeting birth rate, um, yep. there's a sterilization that's happening in society. And the last thing I want to ask you about this is, is with regards to like the queer identity, which I, I'm trying to understand what's really, um, it seems like this, this cue this has been, this is, this is a, has been a growing, um, um, like category for people. Mm -hmm. 
um, and for especially kids. And yeah. it's, it's interesting, like when you, when you're growing up and you're trying to, uh, you're thinking about your future and if, if somebody ident there, there was a, I would say that when I was, um, when I was growing up, there was a, a real effort on, on behalf of the culture to, to really sort of, um, emphasize my, the maleness of that I was experiencing. And I would say the same thing was true about, about females. It was like, th there was a, there was an understanding that again, you were trying to create a culture of flourishing future families, future fathers, future mothers that can bond with each other, pair bond male and female for the rest of their lives and stay totally committed to one another for, for life. Um, but today, if you start to find an element of your identity that doesn't um, comport uh, with your gender, there's an actual cultural movement to, to say, identify with that. That's the most important part about you. And if, if you That's go into that and you identify deeply with that one element of your personality, then, and you just accentuate that and make that the basis of your, you know, your style. And then, yeah. then you're going to immediately be enfolded into a community of people who, yeah, it's just like, it's, it's so shocking how quickly this has turned. And so, yeah, I, it does seem to me like the Bible is, is trying to enforce a very traditional, um, kind of, uh, structure where, Hey, we're, we're trying to make a world that, that for flourishing for these multi-generational families and these all of these different um, these different elements, the, same, the the celebration of the of all the LGBTQ plus, it seems like it's is directly challenging that. But we're not talking about it from the perspective of 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 again, like like that. There's a normative sort of family um, uh, trajectory or design behind what the Bible is actually trying to yeah. advocate for. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the irony on that is I do think you're right. The Bible presents a narrow sexual ethic. One man, one woman covenanted together in marriage um, for the purpose of portraying the gospel. Ironically, though, it's the most narrow sexual ethic, but I think it's actually the ethic that allows for the greatest freedom and pleasure and satisfaction. The world has promised you don't need any sexual ethics. The, there's only actually one ethic that you need sexually in our culture today, and it's consent. That's the only thing you need to have for, for sex. You just need to have two people giving their consent. And you know what's happening? Birth rates are plummeting. Teen sex rates are plummeting. Uh, teen, uh, teen abstinence rates are rising. Nobody really wants to have sex anymore because I think what they realize is sex according to culture's way of doing things, gender according to the world's way of doing things, does not lead to freedom and happiness. You've been lied to. Uh, sex cannot be whatever you want with whomever you want, however you identify, and it actually leads to a flourishing, meaningful relationship. And there's numerous books and evidence that backs that up, that women feel taken advantage of in sex, women feel exploited in sex. Uh, you see birth rates plummeting, all of the things that you just mentioned. The, the, the people that are happiest in their life, with their sex life, with their marriage life, are, are people that are following Christ's ethic as it relates to sex, being covenanted to one another uh, in a marital union. So I would say apologetically, mm. you're looking at sexual ethics. I think you have to poke away at some of those cultural fallacies of saying, listen, culture has promised everybody, be who you want to be, have sex with whoever you want to be, and you'll be the happiest person alive. But what we are seeing today is we are seeing sexual assault, sexual harassment rates at abnormal levels. We're seeing depression, suicide, and anxiety rates at, at highest levels that we've ever seen. Nobody's happy. Nobody is peaceful. Nobody is experiencing the life that they want to. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question of why. Why is that the case? When we've told everybody, be whoever you want to be and live an authentic, happy life, it doesn't actually seem like anybody's actually realizing yeah. that in their life. And if somebody said, okay, that sounds as though you could use that argument for um, same-sex marriage, like just being very narrow about one one man and one man or one woman and one woman. So yeah. how would we take that to the next level and say, okay, why, why does a narrow sexual ethic exclude same-sex unions? Be because going back to our comment about gender, because what we see in the early pages of Genesis 1 and 2 is that God's design is one biologically gendered male and one biologically gendered female. We're not looking for two Adams and we're not looking for two Eves. There is something about difference brought together in oneness that portrays the beauty of who the Lord is in the beauty of the gospel. It, it is not portrayed in that way with one man and one man or one woman and one woman. And 
uh, I have I have scoured scripture. I've read the arguments. I think you have to completely reinterpret the biblical record to arrive at a place where you affirm same-sex relationships and same-sex unions. Um, I, I just, I don't yeah. see it in scripture. I, I don't think that it's possible. Okay. Yeah, totally agree. And then um, talk, talk to me a little bit about these what do you think is happening with this, this, the multiplicity, the Q, the plus, the non-binary, yeah. the what's going on there? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Number one, it is, it's the atomization of identity of, like you said, this sense of family identity, collective identity, that's got thrown away. You have to be the most unique you possible, right? Jeremy's got to stand out. You need to have this own unique identity and go out. And so, yeah, the proliferation of identities, you can't keep up with it. Every time I teach material on this, I have to update my footnotes, update articles, because there's a new identity. Right. Uh, back in the day, there was maybe four. People talked about L, G, B, and T. Queer was more of a pejorative term that was used derogatorily. Uh, the idea of gender binary, gender nonconforming, gender role nonconforming, gender creative, gender expand. I mean, there are literally hundreds of identities that you could choose from on the acronym. And I think it's, I think it honestly shows the absurdity of sin that the, there's a simplicity of the gospel that says biological male, biological female, and culturally in an effort to be whatever it is, the proliferation of all of those letters in that acronym, I think just shows the absurdity of people looking for meaning in this world when that meaning can only be found in Christ. And that's Matthew 10, 39. Jesus says, if you find your life, if you seek your life, you'll ultimately lose it. Mm. The key is you have to lose your life to find it. And we've told a whole generation, hey, go find your life. Go carve out your unique identity. And they are as lost as ever. And the message of the gospel is, no, lose yourself. Self-denial is self-discovery. And it's self-denial in service to Jesus Christ. Mm. That's so good. That's the only uh, direct teaching of Christ that's in all four Gospels. Anyone yeah. who wants to save his life will lose it. Anyone who loses his life or finds his life. Uh, that's, a, that's a great context uh, for that. Well, this is really helpful, Jonathan. Um, I, I would love for you to share uh, how people can hear more. And, and uh, you got, we got Grounded in Grace, Jonathan's new book. Yeah. But where, where can people find you online or what we're... Yeah, would would encourage people to to pick up a copy of the book if you found our conversation helpful or interesting. You can get on Amazon, uh, Grounded in Grace, helping kids build their identity in Christ. The counseling practice that I work at uh, serves families, it serves children, adolescents, individuals. Fieldstonecounseling.org. Uh, we do in person and remote counseling uh, in all fifty states, twenty six different countries. If you're looking for solid biblical Christian counseling, um, our team of forty eight counselors would love to serve you and your family. Awesome. Fieldstone. That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jonathan, for taking the time. And thank you. I just want to say thank you for waiting in. <laughs> I know this is like, this is the most difficult. There's probably lots of topics that are a little less radioactive, but man, we need so much more of this. Um, so well, thank you for w waiting in, really thinking deeply about scripture, how it's interacting with this part of culture. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.